Bipartisan Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. We have a very special conversation this afternoon, a virtual forum that we're co-hosting with the United Way uh, of Connecticut and also United for Alice. Uh, the title of our virtual forum today is When Ends Don't Meet, Supporting Alice Households Post-Pandemic and Beyond. Now, who is Alice? Alice is very familiar to many of us. Alice is an asset-limited, income-constrained, but employed family in the state of Connecticut. Now, this means something for us here in the state of Connecticut. Alice, for many years now, has been the bellwether of our economic success in the state. We can tell how well our state is doing by how many of our families are living paycheck to paycheck. Prior to the pandemic, the 2020 Alice report revealed that 38% of Connecticut's households were financially unstable. In fact, 57% of Black households and 63% of Hispanic households in Connecticut live below the Alice threshold. Without warning, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and exacerbated the financial fragility of thousands of households across the state. In fact, there are many of you who probably found yourselves to be an Alice family. Today, together, we will discuss some of the steps Connecticut can take to better support Alice households. We're so excited, excited that we're joined by uh, several uh, uh, esteemed guests today. First of all, my honorary co-host, Lisa Tepper Bates, President and CEO of the United Way of Connecticut. Lisa, I'm gonna rely on you to help me move the conversation forward because really you are the expert here. Uh, so welcome, you are one of our experts. Uh, we're also joined by Melissa Stanley, uh, Program Director at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Stamford. Uh, the Honorable Brandon McGee, State Representative, uh, Connecticut General Assembly. The Honorable Martin M. Looney, Senate President Pro Tem. And the Honorable Sean Scanlon. Now, several of our speakers will be joining us shortly as they are available. But first and foremostly, I am just so honored to be able to welcome Bryce Covert. Uh, to provide uh, an in some introductory remarks for us. Uh, Bryce Cobert is an independent journalist and contributing op-ed writer at the New York Times and The Nation. Bryce Cobert is a uh, uh, journalist who writes about the economy first and foremost. So she's a contributing writer to The Nation and her writing has appeared in The New York Times, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, New York Magazine, Wired, The New Republic, Slate, and others. She won a 2016 Exceptional Merit in Media Award from the National Women's Political Caucus. She has appeared on several uh, of our networks, uh, including ABC, CBS, MSNBC, NPR, and other outlets. She was previously economic editor at Think Progress, editor of the Roosevelt Institute's new Next New Deal blog and a contributor at Forbes. She's also worked as a financial reporter and head of the energy sector at Merger Market, an online newswire that is part of the Financial Times Group. Bryce, we're so honored to have you here today because really you are the center of gravity of expertise that can really help us peel back the onion of what Alice means and what Alice means for the state of Connecticut. You know, several of you on this panel are experts in your own right. So we're gonna hear from you, whether it's through lived experience, through the work that you're doing, but we're gonna start with you, Bryce, so that you can set up the conversation for us. Welcome, Bryce. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, to everyone for having me be part of this event. Uh, it promises to be so interesting and so important right now. I'm really honored. Um, I'm going to begin my portion uh, with a personal story. Uh, it was my freshman year of college in rural Massachusetts, and in between classes, I was driving to pick up a few things at the CVS in town. I stopped at a light, and I saw a man on a median holding a sign asking for money. I had somehow absorbed a lesson growing up. You shouldn't give homeless people or panhandlers money because it will only lead to bad things. Maybe they'll spend it all on alcohol, maybe on drugs. It wasn't necessarily spelled out. No matter what, it won't do them any good. But I wanted to help. It was the dead of winter, freezing cold outside, and I was warm and comfortable in my car. I drove on, but when I got to CVS, I decided to buy some items for him. I bought a cheap pair of gloves, figuring that his hands were cold, and I assumed he needed something to eat, so I hurriedly grabbed the first thing on the shelf that I could see, pretzel rods. 
he was still on the median as I drove back to campus. So I pulled over, rolled down my window and handed him the things I had bought for him. He told me he was grateful for the gloves, but the pretzels wouldn't do him any good. His teeth, which hadn't been cared for for some time, were too tender to bite something so hard. He could only eat soft foods. I apologized and drove off. No time to buy him something else before class started. I was mortified and heartbroken, but the lesson of that moment has stayed with me for the many years since. I assumed that I knew what he needed, but in the words of Sir Angus Deaton, there are no experts on what a poor family needs, except perhaps the poor family itself. It's impossible to know the exact things that would help improve another person's life. I also assumed that giving a poor person money would be a bad choice, but I and the rest of the country are coming to a new realization. It's one of the best ways to help people who are struggling to make ends meet, to hold on to their homes, their jobs, keep their families warm and fed. This is what we now know. Putting money directly into poor people's hands works. The idea of giving people cash has risen and faded over the centuries, but it is not a new one at all. In Tudor England, Sir Thomas More in his 1516 book, Utopia, argued that every person should receive a guaranteed income. In more modern times, it's an idea that was championed by both Martin Luther King Jr. and the conservative economist, Milton Friedman. President Nixon very nearly enacted a guaranteed income for all Americans. In the 1970s and 80s, four cities instituted a negative income tax, or in other words, a guaranteed income. But this is not how most of our social safety net works today, by and large. Most public assistance programs make apl applicants jump through maddening hoops. Take welfare. After it was reformed in 1990, applicants have to prove that they work or go to school a certain amount of time each month and a failure to resubmit their paperwork can cost them their economic lifeline. The program used to reach over 80% of poor families. It now reaches less than a quarter. Welfare, today known as TANF, is also important because it's the only cash, cash assistance program we offer. Nearly all others are for specific purposes, such as food stamps for hunger or rent vouchers for housing. They go a long way toward alleviating poverty but they also have huge gaps. A third of American families struggle to afford enough diapers for their children, but diapers aren't covered by food stamps or WIC. When a sociology professor interviewed 70 poor women, over half said they were more stressed about affording diapers than food, housing, or electricity. Diapers are incredibly important. Not having enough is associated with urinary tract infections and other health issues for babies. And it can also keep parents from going to work because many daycares require a certain supply. Mothers need money to buy diapers for their babies, but get little assistance from the government. Most families that struggle to afford diapers also struggle to afford other necessities like soap, shampoo, and feminine hygiene products. Each family knows exactly what it needs, but many public programs won't let them buy it. There is now a new movement for giving money to struggling families. The United States has already conducted a few natural experiments. The Alaska Permanent Fund dividend gives every state resident a cut of its oil profits every year. And the Eastern Band of Cherokees began distributing dividends from its casino uh, operations in 1997 to all adult tribal members. Now, a handful of cities across the country have launched their own purposeful experiments. The Magnolia Mothers Trust is the longest running guaranteed income pilot since the Nixon days, which gives $1,000 a month to poor black mothers in Jackson, Mississippi. Stockton, California launched a pilot in early 2019 with a rigorous study design to examine the effects. More recently, the federal government dipped its toe in the water by sending every family under a certain income two rounds of stimulus checks in the pandemic. These experiences can inform what we might expect if governments were to give poor families more direct funds. Economist Ioana Marinescu studied the Alaska Permanent Fund and Eastern Band of Cherokee's casino revenue and determined that at most, recipients of the regular cash payments modestly reduced their working time, but didn't leave the workforce altogether. 
The same effect has been found many times in other countries as well. Giving people money doesn't lead them to give up work. People may find a few more hours in the day to spend with their family or in their home and away from the grind, but they still remain attached to a job. In Stockton, California, recipients were in fact more than twice as likely to obtain full-time employment as others who didn't get checks. The money may have given them time to find the right job or to afford a new suit for an interview. On the other hand, these programs have incredibly important benefits for the recipients. A universal basic income experiment in Finland left people in a better mental state. In Jackson, mothers who received the Magnolia money were 40% less likely to borrow to make ends meet, and their children were 20% more likely to be uh, achieving a grade level. They all met basic needs, worried less, and were more engaged in their families. Stockton's program reduced income volatility, allowed people to afford basic essentials, and improved their mental well-being. I spend more time with my kids than I ever have, said one recipient. Another simply said, I have hope. The stimulus, stimulus checks work too. Most people put the money toward regular household needs, the most common of which were food and rent. Combined with enhanced unemployment benefits and other emergency, emergency measures, the stimulus checks managed to actually drive the poverty rate down in the first three months of the pandemic, even as jobless, joblessness shot straight up. Most of the people enrolled in guaranteed income experiments work, and many of them may not even fall below the federal poverty line, which is incredibly outdated. It's based on a low cost food plan developed by Molly Orshansky, an economist at the Social Security Administration in the 1960s, and doesn't take big costs like healthcare and housing into account. Too many people are what the United Way has dubbed Alice, asset limited, income constrained, employed. MIT calculates that a single working parent in the state of Connecticut with two children needs to earn more than $40 an hour just to be able to actually afford the minimum amount of food, housing, childcare, health insurance, transportation, and other things their family needs. A lack of steady, decent income means that many people work hard but are constantly on the brink. If COVID proved anything, is that too many Americans are one emergency away from financial devastation. Just a small amount of extra money can make all the difference. It's often the difference between stability and disaster. That's why a bigger state in earned income tax credit in Connecticut could mean so much. That's why creating a child tax credit that pays out funds throughout the year could act as a bridge over the unexpected turbulent times that come for all of us. This is the moment to do it. The United States has, for the first time ever, expanded the child tax credit so that it reaches even the poorest families and significantly increased the benefit, all but creating a child allowance, the likes of which is already in place in 17 other wealthy countries. But it's set to expire in a year, and President Biden has only called to extend it for the next four. Still, this is now a bipartisan priority. It's not just hometown hero Rosa DeLauro who is pushing for it as she has for the last 30 years. Mitt Romney released his own expanded child tax credit plan and Marco Rubio championed it when Trump was fighting through his tax cut agenda. Giving money to poor people is an idea whose time has come. The evidence is clear. The politics have aligned. Now is the time to do as much as possible to get money to the people who need it most. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bryce, and, and thank you for that contextualization of our com conversation today. You know, so often when we talk about poverty, we think about poverty as if it were evidence of a condition rather than the condition itself. And when we address poverty as the condition, we really can break intergenerational cycles of poverty that often are perpetuated by the systems themselves that are meant to help. So thank you for that framing. And uh, we're so excited to be joined by the Honorable Martin Looney, uh, Senate President Pro Tem, uh, who will help continue to frame the conversation, especially in terms of his own leadership in these issues and also what Connecticut is doing. Uh, about poverty uh, in this session and beyond. Welcome, Senator Looney. Well, thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be with you all, all today. And just uh, picking up on uh, uh, Bryce's uh, comment about the earned income tax credit, <clears throat> we struggled for 10 years 
uh, to get that enacted. It was always opposed by Governor Rowland and Governor Rell. Uh, and it wasn't until Governor Malloy came in in 2011 that we were able to, uh, to get that across the finish line. The Republican objection always was that the earned income tax credit was an unmerited windfall uh, to people who did not have uh, state income tax liability, completely ignoring the fact that they paid sales taxes, they paid uh, uh, taxes through their through their property tax and licensing fees and all the gasoline taxes, all the other uh, taxes that are uh, that are paid. Uh, and despite the fact that uh, even Republicans at the federal level had recognized that the uh, the EITC at the federal level was a, uh, a a really efficient support for low income working people, it, it was originally passed actually during the Ford administration. But uh, unfortunately, our uh, Republican governors continued to block it. But we did get it passed finally in 2011. Um, at a 30% level, which was uh, uh, pretty advanced at the, at the time. Unfortunately, as part of the, the bipartisan budget in 2017, uh, we had to reduce it back to uh, 23. Uh, I'm certainly supportive of getting it to 30 and beyond. The Finance Committee uh, reported out a bill that would, uh, would have it go to 40%. I'm certainly supportive of that. Uh, coupled with the, uh, we could have a, a double impact, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, the Congresswoman from uh, from my home area, uh, was influential in getting President Biden to include uh, a uh, uh, an expansion of the federal child tax credit um, in his proposal. Uh, she and, and uh, Senator Patty Murray of Washington were successful in, in doing that because it was not scheduled to be part of the president's original proposal, but uh, uh, but now it is. And of course, at the state level, we have uh, Representative Scanlon's proposal to institute a state uh, child tax credit, which also makes sense and targets relief where it is needed the most. So if we can have a combination of uh, the enhanced federal child, child tax credit, which unfortunately might be temporary because it's only during the uh, uh, the emergency period addressed by the federal bill, but uh, doing something at, at, with the EITC at a higher level and also having a, a long-term state child tax credit, those two things uh, would be, uh, I think, immensely important uh, uh, along with our, our scheduled along with our phase in of the minimum wage, which is moving toward $15 an hour. Uh, all of those in combination, I think, will uh, do more than anything we've been able to do in a long time uh, to, uh, uh, to improve the, the plight of low-income working people in our state. Thank you for that, Senator. And, you know, and thank you for that message, because I think you're right. We, we, it's been a long time since we've understood the root causes of poverty, but also the perpetuation of poverty, but we haven't done much about it. And what you're describing is sort of an all hands on deck approach where we're addressing intergenerational poverty from different directions. That makes the most sense. So thank you for that, Senator Looney. Well, we, we know that you're very busy. We hope you can stay as long as you can, uh, but uh, in case you can't, we wanna thank you again for being with us today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I do have to get back to our uh, our bill screening meeting, trying to uh, set us up for the the upcoming uh, uh, week and uh, uh, week and a half in terms of our scheduled sessions, because we're now uh, getting into the crunch time. It's already May third, and uh, uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of work to get done between now and June 9th. So, uh, and Senator, you. just before you leave, on behalf of the United Ways of Connecticut, we want to thank you for your leadership and especially to underscore that while we, all of us, welcome these new federal benefits, it's so important that we remember that the federal benefits are even across the country as they must be, but the cost of living is not. The cost of living in Connecticut is substantially higher than in many states. In fact, 40% higher than in some states, according to the Alice standard. Standard. And child care in Connecticut is twice the cost of child care in some of the other Alice states. So your work together with your colleagues, uh, including uh, Representative Scanlon, including Representative McGee, so very important that we're focused on the action we can take in Connecticut in our state budget. And we know you're focused on that. So we thank you. Sure. Just one last thing, as we know, uh, everyone should know that the Alice numbers are much more indicative of what real poverty is like than, uh, than the federal numbers, which are artificial completely. The federal poverty levels uh, are uh, don't in any way relate to the way people live their lives and the struggles they have at incomes far above the federal poverty levels. And at the, the Alice numbers are much more reflective of the, the reality of what it's like to live in poverty uh, in Connecticut and other states. And, um, and, and one thing in relation to what we need to do, obviously the federal money that's coming in uh, will be uh, extremely helpful, but we have to recognize that we have to plan 
uh, for more long-term state support in this area because the federal money will only be with us for the next couple of years. And if we don't find a long-term funding mechanism to continue these initiatives at the state level, uh, we're gonna go off a cliff uh, in two years when the federal money ends. So that's why I think the work of the Finance Committee this year with, uh, with the work done by Representative Scanlon and Senator Von Farah uh, points us in the direction that we have to go, that we are gonna to have to raise additional revenues uh, uh, in a bill that we passed this year even if some of those revenues don't take effect immediately because uh, we are cushioned by the federal money for the next couple of years. Uh, but the reality is uh, we are gonna get, have to get something on the books that's gonna uh, help us avoid going off a cliff with programs that we may wanna fund uh, over the next two years uh, with a combination of state and federal money. So we, uh, uh, we cannot leave ourselves bereft of revenues uh, when the federal revenue program ends. And that's gonna be part of our struggle this year as the Finance Committee recognized. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're gonna count on your advocacy in the community on behalf of all of this as well. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thanks again. And thank you, Lisa, for that question. You know, you remind us of, of one thing that uh, Bryce said in her opening remarks. She said, putting money directly into poor people's hands works. So tell us a little bit more about that as we start to open up our conversation to our fellow panelists. Why does it work, Lisa, and how do all of these things work together, whether it be with federal stimulus or even beyond, as Senator Looney said? Thank you, Stephen. As, as I'm sure we're going to hear also from Representative McGee and Representative Scanlon, uh, as well as Melissa with her lived experience, the most important thing we can do for our struggling families, and we know that 38% of families in this state are struggling every month to make ends meet, the most important thing we can do is to give them the flexible funds they need to meet the needs that they prioritize. Uh, and I would say I have it in my career working in homelessness, working with people facing poverty, we often see that the benefits that are very circumscribed and prescriptive may or may not meet the need that they have. And with that in mind, we can't always help them to realize the plan they have to achieve financial security if we don't have a resource that will help them do what they need to do. Uh, so I, I hope we'll have more conversation about the importance of those flexible resources. Thank you so much, Lisa. And again, I'm going to be calling on you throughout the conversation. I don't want you to leave us, uh, but I think it's a really important point that we need to meet families where they are. And there is a mutual benefit here. You know, there is the notion of helping others for the sake of helping others. But this is really about helping each other for the sake of the future of the state. So with that, I want to open up this conversation to our friends, uh, Melissa Stanley. Welcome, Melissa, and the Honorable Brandon McGee and the Honorable Sean Scanlon. I'm going to go to you first, Melissa, because I would love for each of you to describe your role in this context of helping break intergenerational cycles of poverty, but not only that, helping families who are living just paycheck to paycheck. Melissa, welcome. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to just give you guys a little history on myself and a little background. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Melissa Stanley. I'm a single mother of three. Two of my children are now adults and out living on their own. I have been a resident of Stanford, Connecticut for about 19 years now. Um, I relocated here from Yonkers, New York, trying desperately to provide a better life for my children. We lived in a very rundown community that was um, pretty crime ridden and it got worse like over the time that I was there. Um, we lived, um, you know, at that time I was living, of course, the same paycheck to paycheck. Um, so due to the cost of living, this was about all that I could afford for my family at the time. Um, I was very young and um, I really wasn't sure um, how I can get out of the situation or what I needed to move on um, or to move forward from the situation. Um, thankfully, after some time, I was able to find um, affordable uh, place to live in Stanford. And um, since then I've held pretty decent jobs that one might think can support a family, jobs such as bookkeeping, payroll, and customer service manager. But as a single adult with children, a decent wage uh, just does, it's just not enough. Um, as 2020 Alice household survival budget indicates, supporting a family in Connecticut is expensive. A single adult with two, ch two young children needs to earn more than $75,000 $7,500,000 to afford basic food, housing, child care, transportation, health care, the cost of a cell phone, and taxes. 
Finances have always been a challenge for me and other families with children. I have struggled to make ends meet and live paycheck to paycheck with little room for savings. There always seems to be unexpected situations that come up that would eat away at the little bit of money that I was able to save. Um, unexpected car repairs had to be one of my biggest challenges um, considering that I wasn't able to afford a new car. Um, a Connecticut child tax credit or increased earned income tax credit as um, has been discussed so far today would have made a huge difference for my family. Even a few hundred dollars make a difference when you have to make every dollar stretch. Right now, this additional flexible source of income will help families that like me are hardworking and um, doing everything that they need to provide for their children. I have always done my very best to provide for my children and to make sure that they have everything that they need, including participating in out of school activities such as dance and sports. To make that happen, I had to spend countless hours volunteering for programs that my children were involved in to offset the cost while working full time. I am very thankful that I had that opportunity to do so because it allowed me to spend quality time with my children and meant that they did not have to miss out on important opportunities. Volunteering led me to getting involved in my community. In fact, I have spent about 16 years with one of the programs volunteering as a cheerleading coach and more recently a co-cheerleading director and board member for the foundation. There are many Alice households that do not have opportunities to volunteer or get involved with their communities because they often work multiple jobs or work second or third shift. I'm a program director at the Boys and Girls Club of Stanford, which is a nonprofit organization. Many of the families that we serve are struggling to provide day-to-day -day essentials because they too are living paycheck to paycheck and would be considered Alice households. During the height of the pandemic, we came across fam um, many families who were facing even more challenges some who lost their jobs and some with reduced work hours. Most of the families we connected with had similar situations to report, such as lack of food, fear of running out of money, childcare, losing their homes, finding help for their children academically and the lack of technology. Speaking with some of the families more recently, I found that many of the children have not engaged academically and have fallen behind in school. Some parents are still unable to go back to work for various reasons. Some have mentioned health risks, hybrid schedules, and childcare is just not affordable, so the challenges do continue. Our state has, first, has seen firsthand what happens when families that are living on the edge suddenly have the rug pulled out from under them. Alice households are experts at managing their household budgets and finding creative ways like I did to support their families. But when living paycheck to paycheck and are unable to save, any loss in income or additional expenses can send your finances spiraling. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experiences and observations. I remain committed to improving the lives of working families and to positively impacting other Alice families. I hope that my experiences have helped you better understand how important Alice families are to communities across Connecticut. And I hope that you will seriously consider ways in which you can support families, workers, and volunteers like me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you for sharing your story, which is not unique. And I bet there are families who are listening now, whether it's in our cities, in our towns, in our suburbs, or in our rural areas, right? Because we always talk about our five Connecticut's that recognize themselves in what you've said. And that did even before the pandemic. But imagine that cliff that you described, how for so many of our families in the last few months just came right up to their doorstep. Uh, based on uh, either losing uh, the income of one of the family members or having income reduced because of circumstance. These are Alice families too. And any one of our viewers who may or may not be experiencing an Alice situation now could. So we have to understand how it is that we can buttress each other during these difficult times and be able to make, make it over those cliffs. Representative Scanlon, I think about as I listen to Melissa, I think about the, the very notion that a family could be working two or three jobs, right, in the state of Connecticut and still not make ends meet. Melissa said 75,000 for a single family of two just to make ends meet. So uh, Representative Scanlon, tell us about why your efforts are important uh, in this equation. Well, first of all, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be on here with Melissa and my friend Brandon and, and Senator Looney and, and all of you. Look. For me, this is personal. I grew up raised by a single mom in this state, and that's not easy. It's a very expensive place for you to be. 
even if you have a partner, uh, not to mention one that may or may not be contributing towards that child. And my mom busted her butt uh, to put food on my table to make sure you know, somebody was there for me to get off the bus because she wasn't, because she was working. Uh, and that's the, the, the reality for a lot of people. Um, and so when I got in the legislature, um, I wanted to try to do something, not just for people like my mom, because it was my mom, but because so many other people are living that life every day in Connecticut. And we often forget about them because we seem to think that Connecticut is this rich and prosperous place. And there is, yes, a lot of wealth concentrated here, but there are many more people who are the Melissa's and the Kathy's who raised me and the mom that raised Brandon that we need to think about every day. And it's not just about them too, because people who are in committed relationships and both parents are there, they're having a hard time too. And so for me, I believe in trickle up economics. People talk about trickle down economics from the, if we, if we just help those at the top, everything's gonna be okay. We know that doesn't work, but we do know that if we put money in the pocket of the people who need it most, they spend it, they go to work, they help themselves and they move up and they live that dream that I think all of us still want to be possible, that you can buy a house in Connecticut, that you can start your own business, that you can afford to send your kids to a community college or a college in Connecticut and not have to worry about the fact that 40% of people in this state don't even have $400 in their bank account uh, in the case of an emergency. So what do I do about that? Well, in January, I became chairman of the tax committee in Connecticut, and I wanted to put my money where my mouth was. And my money right now, uh, is saying that the best way that we can help revive Connecticut and get more people to come off of that Alice factor is to help them live their life. And the best way we can do that is to cut their taxes because they pay a disproportionate amount of taxes compared to those that are the wealthiest. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. And so I put forward a child tax credit in this, uh, in this session year it's the largest tax cut in the history of Connecticut for middle and working class people. The average family in Connecticut who's making the median income, let's say they have two children, are going to get a 40% tax cut on their state income tax. That is humongous. And if you pair that with what Senator Looney was talking about, a plussing up the EITC, um, originally people said, well, let's go to 30%. No, let's go to 40%. That's a 17% increase. We'd be the second highest state in the nation to have the second highest earned income tax credit in America. And with those two things combined, we will help over 1 million people in Connecticut, 852,000 children and 200,000 working poor parents on the EITC. For me, when we look at the fact that um, you know, tax policy can sometimes be wonky and can be boring and people uh, you know, always talk about what, what taxes we're increasing on people, I wanna talk about cutting taxes. And when we can cut taxes for a million parents, we can make it a more affordable state for them. And if we make it a more affordable state for the middle and working class, I believe that we can grow Connecticut in the way that all of us want to see it grow. And that's the way we do it, not by cutting taxes for the people at the top, not by uh, letting businesses get further and further and further away from the reality that all of us live in, in terms of having to pay your taxes and all those things. It's starting at the bottom and using the bottom as the base for growth, trickle up economics. And so, um, you know, I just want to say um, for me, this is personal, uh, but for so many of it's personal because all of us know so many people who are hurting right now. And they were hurting before the pandemic. They're hurting even more now. Now is the moment that we have to meet the moment and help these people in Connecticut. Because if we don't do it now, I'm really, really worried that we will forever see people backsliding into poverty when we could have used this moment to change Connecticut and help them and really turn the state in a different direction. And I pray every day that my colleagues will heed this call. I know that Brandon understands this. I know that Melissa gets it. I know United Way gets it. We just need to get everyone else on board. And I think we can, and this is the year we do big change. And I really just am grateful for you having me today uh, to be able to talk about this and sorry for getting fired up, but uh, super passionate about this. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Scanlon. Uh, Lisa, your reflections, I see you unmuting. Yeah, and you know, it's so exciting, uh, Representative Scanlon, to hear you talking about this and to hear the very personal way that you've embraced this mission, because it is about the Connecticut that we are going to build. And to build the Connecticut that we want, we have to take care of the families who are here and the communities that are here. And we have to draw new young families to our state. We know that our population has been flat for way too long. 
and we have to address that as well. And I just want to reinforce to your point, when we are able to help those families access EITC dollars, we know that for every EITC dollar a family in Connecticut earns, they will return to the local economy a dollar twenty-four. So that's an important stimulus at a time that our communities very badly need it. We know that for every CTC dollar our families earn in Connecticut, they will return a dollar thirty-eight. And we know that when we are able to offer these types of supports, we will stand a chance of drawing those families here to Connecticut so that we can increase the energy here in our state uh, to, to build our way forward to the future. So thank you very much for your comments. Thank you, Lisa. And, and really, uh, Representative Scanlon, those are remarkable numbers, the numbers of the impact that this potentially could have. Each one of those families is a family. You know, we have so many different um, initiatives that we're moving through the state of Connecticut to keep people in Connecticut, whether it's aging in place, whether it's supporting our poor families, whether it's breaking poverty, include, increasing production, increasing the relationship between producers and consumers in a way that is positive. All of those things can be supported by the initiative that you described. So thank you for that, Representative Scanlon. You know, another, another big number that comes to, to mind, uh, Representative McGee, is the evictions crisis. And when we think about that critical relationship between housing security, food security, and long-term family economic security, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on some of the housing initiatives and also Alice initiatives and how they relate to each other. Welcome, Representative. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Sean. And everyone um, on this call today. Um, as you know, myself and uh, Sean, we're running literally back and forth to different meetings. So in this air, you probably could hear the appropriations happening uh, committee. Um, so again, I thank you for this opportunity to weigh in. Uh, believe it or not, Sean's mom is like a mom to me. Uh, while Sean and I, he's clearly he's white and, and I'm black. Um, we have very similar uh, upbringings. Uh, and um, I often think about my time as a young person in the city of Hartford. Uh, my mom and dad were actually married uh, 20 plus years before his passing, uh, but he could never keep a job. And um, we were an Alice family. Um, and for those folks who, who are watching, you know, we all don't know what Alice means, right? It's asset limited income constrained employed um, individuals. Uh, and we're all human, okay? Uh, and, and I just think it's important that we, we start off there. Um, as chair of the, the legislature's housing committee, housing is so critical. Uh, and during this legislative session, I've declared that the fight for fair housing is the fight for racial justice. Uh, and just taking a look at United Way's um, website uh, in the 2020 Alice report, um, it revealed that 38% of Connecticut residents live below the Alice threshold uh, be before uh, the onset of this COVID-19 pandemic. What is that saying? Um, that's saying a lot. Uh, and when you begin to really unpack these numbers, we know that 57% of Black households and 63% of Hispanic households in Connecticut lived below the same threshold prior to the pandemic. And so I am just so thrilled and honored that my colleague, um, alongside his committee members, um, have made this major proposal that would help so many families. Uh, by increasing the EITC to 40% and creating a state child tax credit uh, that would essentially benefit households of color uh, who are disproportionately represented uh, in the Alice population and who have been disproportionately, uh, disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, and and I'll, I'll end on this. Um, because I could probably go on and on and rattle off all of the, the, the proposed bills and bills that we've passed just last week um, in the House of Representatives. Putting money back into the pockets of low and moderate income workers through EITC and reducing the tax burden on families with children through the creation of the CTC 
again, will give those additional dollars, the flexible income that's needed to meet those gaps in essential family budgets. Um, and Melissa talked about it, childcare, in her case, transportation. And by the way, you don't look um, like you have a child who's living on their own. So you look extremely young. Um, and medical expenses. But the conversation we are having today, it must be, it has to be centered in equity, centered on equity. And if we truly uh, seek to foster more inclusive and equitable communities in our state, then we must make a choice to invest uh, in communities throughout the state, especially our black brown communities that we have historically underinvested in. Uh, so again, I'm just really delighted to be here. You'll see my camera go on and off, but I'll be here the entire time. I uh, just need to run back over to, um, I should say Zoom, back over to our probes uh, just to vote. But again, Steve, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative McGee. And you know, as I think about, as we all recall, last March, last April, 2020, uh, last May, 2020, when so many of our families in the state of Connecticut were pushed to the brink, families that were not accustomed uh, to being in that circumstance because they could rely uh, in some way, even two paychecks to two paychecks ahead. So many of us had that shared experience. And we experienced, thankfully, so many of us, the assistance of federal and state government in helping address that emergency. In some ways, what you're asking for is to continue that same type of intervention and assistance for our families that continue to need it most. So we are, we are continuing in those values that we really sank into this last year. You know, I want to talk a little bit about the eviction crisis, just a little bit more, because Bryce, we have you here, and I know that you've been focusing on ensuring that families don't go it alone. So tell us a little bit about uh, this notion of the right to counsel when talking about evictions. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think everyone knows that you are guaranteed a lawyer if you're facing criminal charges. People may not be as aware that in civil cases like eviction, you're not guaranteed a lawyer. And in most places, it's very difficult to get um, help, even if you are low income. Legal aid lawyers are just totally stretched. Um, so there is a movement across the country to guarantee the right to counsel, particularly in eviction proceedings where so much is on the line. Um, it was going on before the pandemic. Um, my home city, New York City, uh, was the first in 2017 and a handful of cities joined shortly thereafter. Um, but the pandemic has just completely accelerated it. Uh, four more cities, as well as um, the state of Washington, which is the first state now, have guaranteed counsel and, um, and in eviction. And Connecticut is poised to potentially be the next state. Um, there's a bill being considered right now um, that would do that by October. I think people see it not just as a response to the pandemic, where we've seen so many people at risk of eviction in a way that perhaps we haven't in decades, um, but also something to ensure fairness and equity in this process moving forward so that when your house is on the line, you're not going it alone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bryce, for that. And thank you for your work. I know that you put the link uh, to your research and uh, uh, expose on that issue in the chat, and we appreciate that. Um, Lisa, I'm going to come back to you in a little bit because you know, I, I really want to hear your reflections on how these things work together. And, you know, you think about making work pay, right? That whole notion of our residents are working and it's still not working for them. What does that mean, Lisa? I'm glad that you focus on that, Stephen, because part of the challenge that we have is the fact that uh, so many people are working as hard as they can in the jobs that are available to them, and yet we know that a lot of Connecticut residents simply cannot secure 40 hours of work in a single job. 52% uh, of the workers in our state are paid hourly and have incredible fluctuations in their schedules every week. Uh, so we know that that's an added dimension of the insecurity that workers in Connecticut face, and, and further to uh, what 
Representative McGee uh, also raised to our attention, we know that children of color are more likely to be in those households facing this stress, facing the stress of not being able to make ends meet every month. And we will pay over and over as communities for that. We will pay because in the schools there will be uh, issues that the school tries to address. We know that children coming from financially stressed households are more likely to have problems in school. Uh, so when we invest up front, when we give those families the ability to meet their needs, uh, we know that that will in fact pay dividends for those children and will in fact be offset by some of those damaging costs we might otherwise face. Thank you, Lisa. Melissa, you know, I want to come back to you for a second because I'm, I'm really simmering in this idea of working, working families not being able to afford the state in which they live, right? There is a benefit to the employer that your industry and your hard work is part of their everyday, but the benefit doesn't also go to, go to you. And it's difficult for Alice families to stay in Connecticut. What does that mean to you uh, for the families that I know that you know you represent all over the state. Well, um, I guess um, the, I guess the importance is, um, you know, of course, not just me, of course, as I said, you know, my children are aging out, aging out of the home. But of course, I work with, you know, younger, younger kids. Um, and seeing a possible way for them to, these families to get some help um, is my focus. And um, whatever I can do to make sure that, you know, we're doing what we need at our level to see that, you know, when these funds come out, like parents are prepared to do whatever they need to do, um, you know, to receive funds or, you know, if I can, you know, point them in the direction to get help that they need, um, you know, I can, still continue to do that uh, on my end, uh, pretty much. Thank you for saying that. You know, it's remarkable that whenever we ask our families, you know, what do you do? What are you gonna do? Our families often are on their own and have to say, you know what, I'm gonna figure it out because right. you have to, right? right? And that's what's really tough because so many of our industries rely upon their fam our families and yet our families are left alone to kind of figure it out on their own. So Representative Scanlon, what does it mean in a state where there is so much wealth, uh, there is industry, uh, there is growth, and yet our very families who are part of the workforce are struggling to make ends meet when they're working a full day, if not, if not longer? Well, I think it's indicative of the fact that there's two Connecticut's, right? Uh, there's a Connecticut that we like to talk about and there's a Connecticut that we don't. And the one that I'm trying to talk more about is the one that we don't. And that's what the whole purpose of today is all about. Um, you know, during the pandemic um, last March, my wife runs a nonprofit that helps women and girls on the shoreline called the Women and Family Life Center in Guilford. And they partnered up before the CARES Act was passed, um, before that unemployment money started to roll to help families that were really in need down here. And there's a misconception that the streets of Guilford and Brantford are sort of paved with gold. The need was tremendous. There was hundreds and hundreds of people who came forward who were not Alice families that overnight became them. Uh, and that's so important for us to consider is that the stereotypes of those families are that they're one people in one place and they just are stuck there and nothing we can do can help them. This is a fluctuating, changing situation for people, whether you live in Guilford, Glastonbury, Hartford, Bridgeport, you name it, it's, it's a possible for you. And you never think you're gonna find yourself in that situation until you do. What I'm trying to say is that I think the tax changes that we are proposing this year are going to be what might be the difference between somebody sliding back further and further and continuing to make that progress. I'll say another thing too, 75% of the people polled recently um, said that when childcare became an issue, the woman was the one who had to take the burden up, right? And that is something that is a really big problem, not just for those people, but the workforce in general, right? Because when women leave the workforce and when women are the ones that have to make that choice, it sets them back, but it also sets all of Connecticut back. And so when we talk about something like an extra $1,200 or $1,800 to, 
just on the child tax credit alone, that money goes a long way in terms of you being able to do things like find childcare, um, address those needs that you have, stay in the workforce. And I just think if we look at this from a perspective of dollars and cents, we're gonna lose every time. I wanna look at it from the real people. That's a million different people out there who will benefit from this. And sometimes my colleagues, it's really easy to sort of say, well, geez, well, Scanlon's tax credit costs $300 million. Yeah, but what does that mean for 852,000 children in the state? That's what we have to look at this like. It's not about money. It's about the future of Connecticut and children literally are the future of Connecticut. And I think we have to invest in them and frankly, invest in their parents. Thank you, Representative Scanlon. And, and I really love that message. You you invest in the family and your, your returns are, are tenfold. And that's really true, I think, for the state of Connecticut. So much of what we do here is really refocusing around the family as the family may come. And we're finding that that really is the sustainable model. Um, you know, Lisa, there's so much that's happening at the United Way uh, that relates to these efforts. You know, as a person looking from the outside in who's been inside as well, tell us about what you're seeing in the state of Connecticut some of these initiatives that you're seeing and how ultimately they will help the families that you serve at the United Way. Well, I think what we're hearing here, including from Melissa's personal story and from Representative Scanlon's personal story, a very small amount of money at the right point in time to stabilize a family, to give them some breathing room can mean a lot uh, and can actually uh, save us again from a path uh, that can lead from crisis to crisis and crises are expensive. Uh, the more that we can help our families to achieve that stability, to have that breathing room, uh, the more their children will thrive, the more they can build a path to that sustainable future. Uh, we know that uh, as Representative Scanlon said, that investment in our families, in our children, will yield dividends for our communities. Uh, but we have to make the investment first. Uh, so that's what I hear. And Stephen, our calls to 211 for urgent help have expanded by 400% during this public health crisis. Uh, so we know that Connecticut families are hurting, uh, but we know that that has drawn attention to the opportunity to do some things now that will not be temporary fixes, but will in fact yield that benefit to our families over time. And that's the kind of Connecticut that we want our state to be. Thank, thank you for that, Lisa. You know, Bryce, in that context, what do you say to this notion that there just isn't enough to go around? Uh, what do you say to, uh, to the notion of scarcity in this context? You know, I understand, particularly in states that, you know, budgets are finite. Um, but I think a lot of people in this event have rightly pointed out that it's about where you're investing the resources and what dividends that pays. You know, Lisa made such a good point that there are costs to not helping low-income families incurred by the whole state. And then there are dividends reaped by giving people the little extra financial breathing room to be financially stable, um, to help them go out and get jobs. You know, like I said, in Stockton, California, people who got guaranteed income were far more likely to find employment. And I think when you're not living um, in a constant state of financial emergency, it's actually a lot easier to get your life looking the way you want it, finding the, the things that you're trying to achieve for your employment, for your family. Um, so it's, it's where you put your limited resources. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Bryce. That's right. How it is that we invest tells a story not only about how it is, how it is that we want to really not only help our individual families, but how we see the future of our state really developing in a way that's uh, that's more unified and successful. You know, I, we do have some time for questions from our attendees. So, uh, Lisa Alexander, I know that you have had your hand raised for quite a while. I'm going to allow you uh, allow you to talk just now, so you can join us and you can ask your questions of our panelists. Welcome, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry, no, that was a mistake. Oh, well, no, no problem at all. Lisa, you've now become part of the panel, but, uh, but I, I really do, um, I really do want to thank uh, each of you who have asked questions in the chat, and not only that, but also uh, celebrated um, uh, uh, 
celebrated uh, the fact that each of our panelists here brings lived experience to this conversation as well. We're not talking about the other. We're not talking about a different state. We're talking about Connecticut and Connecticut's families. And thank you, Representative Scanlon, for, for really doing the landscape analysis of where our family, our Alice families are. I bet that uh, more and more families now are seeing themselves in this conversation. And Steve, can I can I just say that I, I saw a question in the chat about how do you combat this um, mindset of scarcity, right? And someone who has done this pretty well, I think, actually, is Andrew Yang, who um, I'm not sure how folks feel about him or his campaign, but um, he's a big proponent of UBI, and I've seen him talk about this. And he said the antidote is about uh, instead of a mindset of scarcity, it's a mindset of abundance. If you are doing well, that's good for me too. And I think that that's a really important thing that we have to focus on more, which is that this is not a race to the bottom where we're all competing against each other. There are some politicians who would like you to think that that's the way it is. And they fiend off of that uh, mentality because it helps them politically. In reality, we're all in this together. Uh, my favorite Dr. King quote is that we may have come on different ships, but we're in the same boat now. And that is the way um, that I think we have to start approaching economics in this state. Um, is that what's good um, for the single mom in my district uh, is the same as what's good um, for an employer who's looking to hire somebody like my mom who might have the skills that you could really benefit from, but she can't leave. She can't enter the workforce because she's tied down because she doesn't have childcare. She doesn't have that help. We have to figure that out because if we could all prosper together, the state would be going so much better in, in terms of economic uh, you know, sort of renaissance, which is what we really need here in Connecticut. Everyone decries our rankings in these lists, but we look at the wrong solutions for getting rid of that. It's not about necessarily cutting red tape or taxes for a certain kind of people. It's getting more people who want to move here. Um, there's more people who leave Connecticut every year that are working class and middle class than that are really rich. And there's, you would never know that if you watch the news because everyone is so worried about three people leaving. It's the people, the 3,000 people who can't afford to stay here anymore that we really need to worry about as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much. You know, I've been honored to be in this work with all of you for so long now, uh, working on behalf of children and their families and thinking about uh, this, this notion of how it is that children and their families not only are the future of the state and how it is that we frame it in that way, but they are resourceful. They are entrepreneurial. They are making logistical decisions, right, on how it is to make that paycheck to paycheck work for them. You've never seen more industry than when you look at the struggling family. And if, as, if we can continue to invest in that, Representative Scanlon, I think you're absolutely right. That is really a much better prognosis for the state of Connecticut as well. Lisa, I would love to, uh, as we come to a close, first of all, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. And Lisa, I would love to have you you uh, really bring us to a close with your closing remarks. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Bryce Covert uh, as our keynote, uh, to Representative Scanlon, uh, to Senator Looney, uh, and also to Representative McGee, and certainly to Melissa for sharing your personal experience. Uh, what's exciting about today is that because of the leadership uh, of Representative Scanlon and his colleagues who are willing to engage in this robust debate about what we really can do in Connecticut now to reinforce what's available for our struggling families. Uh, we're, we're looking at the prospects of actually changing the equation for these families who have struggled so hard, paycheck to paycheck for so long, uh, and for whom we haven't done enough. Uh, this could be a pivotal year uh, and so Representative Scanlon, we, we thank you for that. Uh, it's critically important that we address this issue. And, and I just wanna reinforce that it is essential that we remember that the federal resources are welcome. Uh, what President Biden is seeking to do by expanding the table for Americans is, is terrific. It's very welcome. Uh, but Connecticut is a very high cost of living state. We cannot rest on those federal benefits alone if we mean to meaningfully change the way forward for, uh, for the, the struggling families, the struggling Alice families here in Connecticut. 
Uh, so Representative Scanlon, we'll look to you and your leadership to help fighting the good fight and remembering in our legislature that uh, we have a job to do here with the resources in our budget, which is our value statement for our state. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I'm more optimistic than I think I've ever been about the future of Connecticut because of this great project. So thank you and thanks to all of you. Uh, and please uh, look at the Alice uh, report if you haven't had a chance to do so. Uh, Annie, if you can put the link in the chat, that would be great. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who joined us here today. Thank you, Lisa. And everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.